Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Um, today will be the second lecture by Dan Fox on um, symmetric trilinear forms and Einstein-like equations. So please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those of you who have returned from last week. I at least now know that you're patient folks. So let me just recall the, the, the sort of the general setup I was talking about last time. And uh, so the, the, the basic data here is, is you, you have some module of, of, of tensors whose symmetries are codified by some irreducible SLM module. And if one had a spin structure, one could work with spin objects as well. And it, it really formally nothing much would change. But I, I don't want to talk about that because I'm only going to talk about a very special case of this setup anyway. But I think that there's there's something more general that can be done, and, and maybe somebody gets interested in doing it. And and so it, it, in this setting, you're just talking about trace-free tensors with certain symmetries given by some young diagram. And I, I want to have a bilinear map which which associates the, the two such tensors uh, or tensor of with curvature tensor symmetries. And I, I impose some normalization. In general here, if I didn't suppose that my tensor omega was trace free, here I would have a second term that involved the norm of its trace, but I'm supposing it's trace free. And so this is the kind of normalization I can, can impose. And it, it, there's a general representation theoretic thing which has to be worked out, which is when such maps, I'm, I'm asking that it be a module map that be equivariant. So, so when such maps exist, and I haven't, I haven't done that, I'm just going to talk about it in some very special case. But, and then the other ingredient are, are what are called generalized gradients. And so the, the idea here is simply that, um, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me just quickly add a page and, uh, I think now I should have a I should have another another page. No, I didn't add. Um, what did I do wrong? I mean, I'll just write in the margin since I can't figure out what I'm doing. But in, in general, well, I, I wrote it actually on the next. the The idea is this is is encapsulated here. So you 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 have here you have the, the Young diagram which corresponds to the the trilinear symmetric tensors that are trace free. And, and when you take a covariant derivative, that's like tensoring with the standard representation. And that decomposes into completely symmetric core tensors, tensors with these symmetries, which means they're skew symmetric in two indices and there's skew symmetrization over the first three indices is zero. And then there's a divergence term, which is again, completely symmetric. So the generalized gradients are, are, are you take the covariant derivative and you project onto one of these factors. So you hear you have here the 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 one that's the projection onto the trace free completely symmetric tensors, which I haven't written below, is the conformal killing operator. The one that's the projection onto this component would, would, is is here. Normally, I'd have to write down some trace terms, but if I'm supposing this is tra trace free, I well I, I'm defining I'm writing this, but I I should probably be writing the trace free part of this would be the actual generalized gradient that shows up here. And, and then this is the divergence, which happens to be the adjoint of, of, of the other operators in, in this case. So in, in general, if the symmetries here are more complicated, then you get many more terms here because it's basically, you can stick on this, this single box where you can glue it on here, you can glue it on here in this case. But if you have, if you have more hooks, if you start with something that looks more complicated, you can add boxes on in, in more ways. You can add it here, you can add it here, you can add it here, you get three sum ends. And then you can remove boxes in more ways also. And, and so you, you, can get, you can get out uh, this, but you could also get out this. So you get a lot more generalized gradients if you, if you, if you start with more complicated symmetries. And what somehow the, the, the completely symmetric, completely anti-symmetric cases are the simplest one because you get the fewest sum ends here. And 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 that that makes the situation somewhat easier. And and in general, the the so these different things they sum up in some sense to the just to the covariant derivative. And so there there if if you look at think if you call one of these generalized gradients A and 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 then you look at something like this and you sum over all the different choices 
you wind up getting something that looks roughly like this, like the Bachner Abbasian. And, and the line of argument that goes back to Steinweiss and Branson asks sort of which sums of, which sub sums of this form give you elliptic operators. And, and the answer is in a paper of Branson's. And I, I don't really uh, care much about it here, but here the point is I'm gonna have my, my Kodazi operator, my divergence operator, my conformal killing operator. So I don't know you call this one L and here you have your C and you have your C star if you like. And the point is that when, when, when something is in the kernel of these two, then, then the, what remains is something like L star L. And, and so the, the Bachner Laplacian of something that's in the kernel of these two guys is, 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 is just this guy. And, and, and that gives you access to things like the Weizenbach machinery. So uh, let me come back here and, and just with that kind of thinking in mind, um, you, you want to build a stress energy tensor, which is going to be divergence free. And, and basically that will follow from some identity of this form. And last week I wrote this and this in terms of interior multiplication of X and the- uh, and to, Dan, just yeah. when you're calling this and this, we don't see what you're pointing at. Ah, uh, you don't mouse. see the, oh, yeah. I gotta use the mouse. Yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry, thank you. Okay, so uh, here I'm writing the symbol of, of A star and here I'm writing the symbol of A. Last week I wrote this in a different way. I wrote, I wrote this is essentially, so if A for instance is something like the, the conformal killing operator, this is essentially the trace free part of the symmetric tensor product of X and, and, and omega. And then that would be adjoint to interior multiplication of X into the left-hand term. And that's how I wrote it last week. And, and likewise here, if this is the divergence operator, its symbol is just interior multiplication of X and the slot on which you take the divergence. And th there's an ambiguity there in the sense that if you write using interior multiplications, because you really need to specify in which slot your interior multiplying X. When you're talking about symmetric or any symmetric tensors, it won't matter up to sign, but it, for more complicated symmetries, in fact, there's really different pairings there that are available. And so I think this is probably a better way to write it. And then again, this, this beta and gamma really aren't free parameters here. They're, they're things that would be determined by the representation theoretic data and all of one's favorite normalizations regarding the metric and 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 how how one defines the the, the normalizations of the projections that define the generalized gradients is actually something one has to think hard about. And Branson, for instance, in his paper devotes a fair amount of space to that issue. And um, so so there's a lot somehow that's not specified here and which in any given particular case needs to be thought through carefully and worked out. There should be a general machinery that tells you exactly what to write here in every in all cases in terms of purely representation theoretic data, in terms of weights. Uh, but but and I'm not claiming that I've worked that out. What I'm claiming is that I'm going to show how it works in a particular case, and there is an underlying scheme that I think works more generally, and it should be interesting to explore. And if one accepts that, then one has this hierarchy of equations. So the claim is that this hierarchy of equations makes good sense for sure in the cases in which I'm dealing with an anisymmetric uh, differential form, omega, and this is D and D star, or in the case where this is a completely symmetric tensor and I choose A to either be the the conformal killing operator or to be the Kodazi, the trace free Kodazi operator. And it's the last case on, on which I'm going to focus in, in this talk. And so the three equations are somehow a generalized projective flatness, at Einstein equations, and constant scalar curvature, the way to think about them. And the, the reason for, for focusing on the Kodazi type tensors is going to be that, that um, I'm able to give examples of solutions. So <laughs> that that's the other issue. You have some general scheme like this. It could very well be the case there are no solutions. And in particular, equations like this are kind of frightening in that sense. I mean, it's one, so we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But, so the actual equations I want to look at are, are the case where 
I, I want these equations to mean that omega is a trace-free, uh, divergence-free Kodazi tensor, where Kodazi tensor means that this expression here vanishes. Okay. And this is a typo uh, right here. Uh, right here, there should be a this should be zero equals okay, all of this. I was trying to compactify it so it fit on one line in the slide, and I left out the zero. So, so formally, the way to remember this is they look just like the Einstein Maxwell equations. It's just the tensor is no longer in any symmetric form, it's a symmetric form, and it's it's a trace-free divergence free Kodazi tensor instead of a for a trace-free tensor, being Kodazi implies um, uh, divergence-free also. So, in fact, okay. So that's the that's the setup. And 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 what I had explained last time is that there are at least two cases where I know that there exist solutions. Uh, if I have basically, if I take H and and here this pi is the omega, but it's it's the second fundamental form of a of a mean curvature zero a hypersurface in a pseudo Riemannian space form. Here, non degenerate simply means the induced metric is is again a metric. In other words, the, the restriction of the metric and the ambient uh, manifold it is a metric on the sub manifold, and this pair satisfies the strongest of these these equations. Okay, and that's just that's just the standard. It's actually just the sort of rewriting of the standard gauss kodazi equations. And it's for one of the choices of epsilon. And I can't remember. The choice of epsilon is actually is the, the modulus, so to speak, of the unit normal. You, you choose a unimodular normal to your hypersurface. And so it's eight, the, the ambient metric evaluated on that normal is either plus or minus one. And that's the value of epsilon. I mean, probably minus the value of epsilon. And then the other case is if I consider mean curvature zero Lagrangian immersion in a Kähler manifold of constant holomorphic sectional curvature, or I can modify Kähler to be para Kähler or pseudo Kähler. And non degenerate again means that the, the restriction of the metric on the ambient manifold is a genuine metric on the sub manifold, so say space like something like this. And um, the the sec the second fundamental form in that in the, that case will be a be a tensor that that really has its up its upper index is in the in the normal bundle, but using the symplectic form, I can I can I can lower that to get a, a, a three tensor that's completely symmetric, and and um, the the the, the, the Kähler form or the para Kähler form. And, and so that's what this pi is really. And again, those solve these couple of projectively flat equations. In this case, the epsilon is determined by it's it's equal to minus one in the Kähler case and plus one in the para Kähler case. And it's determined by the, the geometry of the ambient manifold. So the, it, this at least, well, if you believe that there exists lots of mean curvature zero sub manifolds of the forms indicated, this shows that there are lots of solutions to the strongest form of these equations, uh, something which is not uh, readily apparent. And it raises a number of questions. Um, so one is, is, can you say anything about uh, the, the behavior of solutions? So I'll explain that, yes, one can say something uh, about the solutions, at least in Riemannian signature. Probably one can say things in other signatures I haven't explored it. Are there any kind of general existence theorems for solutions to these equations here, these equations here? And, and I, one of the things I want to explain is that is that um, existence theorems for what are called affine spheres give give rise to existence theorems to these equations in the case of of completely symmetric three tensors. And then I want to I want to give examples of solutions that um, that solve these Einstein, these coupled Einstein equations, but don't solve the coupled projectively flat equations. And, and 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 there's obviously a lot more to be done, but that's 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 sort of the plan for today at least. So, um, so let me address this first part, which is depending on one's background, is the most familiar or the least familiar part. 
So this is basically an old story in some sense. Um, there are, the, the first question is, are, are there any uh, tensors which satisfy these two equations, okay? So if I think in the, in the case of differential forms, it's just Hodge theory, right? I have a, uh, the, I have a harmonic representative of every cohomology class. And, and so the cohomology is telling me the solvability of an a priori solvability of a question like, an equation like this, independent of its, of its linkage to this. I mean, the point is it may be that in fact, there are no non-trivial solutions to these equations. In this case, this equation is just the usual equation for a constant curvature metric. Or this equation is just the usual Einstein equation for a metric. So in that case, these equations are stupid in a sense. And so those cases are identified by vanishing theorems. And they're for, as I say, for, for any symmetric forms, there's a good, a good, a good theory, which is Hodge theory. And for Cartesian conformal killing tensors, there are um, there are actually some pretty strong results. And I put some references here. Um, I could actually add my own name on this, on these, from something I posted in the archive 15 years ago that nobody read. But, and th there's also um, uh, I, really the name, uh, another name is missing here, which is, is Kobayashi in a sense. Uh, so, wh what, what do I mean? Um, at least on, on a Riemann surface. So if I have an oriented Riemannian uh, oriented surface with a Riemannian metric and conformal killing tensors and Kodazi tensors are exactly the real parts of holomorphic differentials. Uh, so the, a real part of a cubic holomorphic differential would be a, uh, a, a rank three Kodazi tensor, phase three divergence three Kodazi tensor. And, and Likewise, the holomorphic vector fields give you conformal killing fields and, and so forth. And so in, in that setting, for instance, um, the you have a complete theory that comes from the rerun Roch theorem. And, and so you can say exactly on how many parameters depend these different tensors on, on surfaces. It's completely understood. And Kobayashi generalized those kinds of the, the vanishing aspect of such theorems. So such a theorem, so so on, on compact Riemann surfaces, what can you say? You can say there are no conformal killing tensors. The genus is at least two, and likewise with Kodazi tensors, you can say that you can say that they depend on so many parameters that the genus is is, is at least one. And on the sphere, there are no trace free to three Kodazi tensors. And so Kobayashi extended those kinds of results to 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 higher dimensional complex manifolds. And and then in the general real setting. The results are due to people like Darvekov, Sharafutnov, and then and later there's an article called Heil Semel and Moriano, and uh, which has a, they have a lot of overlap, but the techniques are quite different. And then in the case of Kardazi tensors, there's an old article of Berger and Eben, which is somehow motivating for everything I'm talking about, about symmetric two tensors, and then Stefanov in the 90s um, published uh, some results here. And, and the general flavor of these results is that. And to have Kodazi trace free divergence free Kodazi tensors, you need to have negative curvature in some sense, and and you won't have them in positive curvature, and and and, and the contrary with conformal killing tensors. You need to have positive curvature if you won't have them in, in the regime of negative curvature. And there's a sort of general machinery for for these kinds of vanishing theorems. It's outlined in an article, a little note of Hitchens about eight years ago. Um, that, that would apply in principle to general tensor symmetries. And um, I think Semelman also has some, probably with Weingart, has, has another article, not the one I'm referencing here, where they, they address that to some extent. So, so that that that's allows you in general to, to say that in certain cases, there aren't any interesting solutions. And, and usually it's suggestive that there should be interesting solutions in the cases that aren't excluded. But it, it's not good enough usually to give you existence results. It's to say it, on on surfaces you can actually get existence results for tensors of these sorts. But in higher dimensions, there are the theory is less well developed. Um, there, there there's something published. I'm, I'm I'm probably being a little unfair, but it's 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 fairly recent. And if you if you have a solution to to the to these just to these equations right here. 
you can you can say something about them also. So the machinery is, is using Weizenbach formulas, and and the the typical Weizenbach formula is, is saying that is expressing that this applied to some tensor is equal to the the curvature operator acting on the tensor in an appropriate way, and so how do such formulas come up in, in the context we're dealing with? Well, it, it goes back to this kind of thing. You're assuming here you're looking at you have some you write the general the usual Wagner Laplacian as a sum of these Laplacians that come from these generalized gradients, and you're supposing some term here vanishes and you have the remaining ones. And those are what you need the Weizenbach formula for. Now, in the in the case of both differential forms and, and symmetric tensors, there's only one or two terms that remain here. It's very simple. And so and so you get something manageable you can do by hand. And 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 that's what happens. And, and in the case of Kodaji tensors, I mean, just uh, uh, here's what the form, here's what the Weizenbach formula looks like on this slide here. Um, so that if you're supposing that omega is in the is trace free, divergence free, Kodaji tensor, these two terms vanish, and you're left with the Laplacian. And this is just the dumb Laplacian. That this just means, you know, I'm applying this. Uh, and and this is some curvature operator which I've expressed above, and, and whose particular form really doesn't matter. But and and so this is what I what I'm talking about when I'm talking about it. Weizenbach formula is you take this formula and then you use it to get a formula for the Laplacian of the norm squared of the of the of the tensor, which tends to have a form like this. And again, these equations I'm assuming would imply these two terms vanish. And you're left with a gradient term that you can control via what are called refined Cato inequalities, and and some term that's quadratic in the in the curvature tensor. And this term that's quadratic in the curvature tensor, how you can control it depends on the signs of the curvature. And and so what, what do I mean by Cato inequalities? Is basically you you can you can estimate that there you you, you get inequalities that relate this and this. And you get such an inequality just from Cauchy Schwartz that goes like this, but usually you can put a better constant here, where the better constant uh, um, depends on uh, the, the particular symmetries of, of, of omega and, the, and that it satisfies something like C star and C of omega R zero, it, that it's in the kernel of various of these generalized gradients. And, and so you can improve the constant. And, and so that you need that in general to get sharp estimates and then you get out, you can reduce to things like this. And so then depending on the sign, basically you either work directly with this or you work with a differential inequality like this, which you use depends on the, on the signs of the curvature terms. And in one case, you would integrate this by parts on a compact manifold or on a complete manifold and, and to get out uh, what I'm gonna call Simon style results. And, and, and the other case you'd use, you'd use this differential inequality directly and you'd use maximum principal arguments in the style of Kalabi Cheng Yao to get growth estimates on this tensor here. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll state the kind of results that you obtain in that way in just a minute. But what I wanted to say back here was that in the general scheme I'm describing, all of this machinery is completely developed. The Weizenbach formulas for generalized gradients were worked out by someone of Weingart and, and refined Cato inequalities have been completely analyzed for these for, for, for tensors that are in the kernels of these generalized gradients by Branson in a different paper than the one I was citing earlier, and then also by Calderbank, Gato, Shoni, Herzli. And there's a nice expository article by Herzli, which really explains all this in detail. The, the, the use of Weizenbach and, and Cato and the Cato inequalities in this way is, I, I think it basically originates with Kalabi. And then, and then a lot of Yao's early work is, is basically, when you break it down, a, a very careful use of these two ingredients. And so the, for me, the model result, uh, which actually is a case of what I'm talking about, and as I'll explain later, is, 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 is Kalabi used this kind of machinery to show that if you have what's called a hyperbolic affine sphere, if it's Blaschke or Equi affine metric is complete and has non-positive Ricci curvature. And I, I, one of the things I want to explain today is a little bit how, how this is essentially a growth estimate on a solution to these equations in the case that K is equal to three. This is a, 
a rank three, trace free divergence free Kodazi tensor, which in the in this case would be um, the cubic picked form of the affine sphere. I'll explain what those things mean later on. Okay, so let me just if you here I'm writing this curvature operator on on this tensor. It's something that often people just work with this part this part of it here. Um, but I, I've thrown in a Ricci term. This is so that this preserves the trace free condition. Okay. And, and of course, one's choice of normalizations matter here, the K's and all this. But, and, and my inner products are probably not your inner products. But this quadratic curvature term is really just the quadratic form associated to this operator. And it has a nice expression in terms of the Ricci part of the curvature and the full curvature tensor. And so one can work out these Weizenbach formulas by hand in the case of completely symmetric tensors is to say one doesn't need to specialize the general machinery, although one could do that. That's actually quite difficult to do in my experience in practice. Translating these general formulas in terms of weights of representations and so forth in the expressions like concrete expressions like this with tensors, uh, some people are good at this. I'm not one of them. And, and it, it, sometimes it's easier just to do it all by hand. And so you get out these kinds of formulas. What matters here are not the coefficients in the particular formulas, rather the structure. That one, what one needs to, for this general scheme, I think, to be working in general, is is essentially the right conditions on the representations and all these different ingredients, so that one is getting out machinery like this, all the way through to the end. And this is going to be the setting in which one is able to analyze. Uh, the behavior of solutions and existence for solutions. Although I'm not speaking about existence right now in a, in a PDE sense. So here, here's what I mean by a Chen Yao, Kawabe Chen Yao style growth theorem. So this will work when, when I'm assuming that epsilon is positive. So that means that I'm assuming this sign is negative here. And I, I'm considering these equations. And so I'm supposing I have a complete Riemannian metric and I have a trace free symmetric K tensor, which is divergence free in Kodazi, and it and and the together they solve this equation, this coupled projectively flat equation. Then I can conclude that this modified scalar curvature is non-positive. So in the in the K equals two case, you can say something slightly stronger. Okay, and you can actually say it's it's negative. And the this is proved just directly from this inequality and, and the special form that this curvature term takes that follows from this equation. Okay, so because the Riemann, the curvature tensor is, is actually just expressed in terms of the metric and the tensor omega, uh, this becomes some fourth order quartic polynomial in, in omega, and you have to do some linear algebra to estimate it and and you get out what you need and and, and it, it, it takes some work but but you get these kinds of estimates the you in the case of maximal space like hypersurfaces in any de sitter space I, so i told you in that case that the h and and the second fundamental form uh, solve solve these equations one recovers a result due to ishihara and in the k equals three clay case, you, you can actually, this exact setting is what's relevant to proving this result of Kawabe here. And in fact, one can improve the argument to get non-positive Ricci curvature. One has to, rather than working with the norm of the, of the tensor, one has to work with the, uh, the, the, the largest eigenvalue of, of this Ricci type term here. So this Ricci type term, this guy right here, is, is actually something like, like this. And so you, you actually have to work with this rather than with this. And in, in this kind of, you have to do this kind of equation for this guy rather than this. And it becomes substantially more complicated. And, and there is something very special in the linear algebra when k equals three that, that is not clear how to advance when k is bigger than three, at least not clear to me. 
so that I, I'm not able to make a similar claim to this when when k is bigger than three. But it's just this is to show the flavor of the results that one gets out. The alternative is where you have a plus sign here. So everything is the same here, except that I changed the 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 minus sign to a plus sign. And and in this case, you you integrate the uh, you integrate directly this equation, and you get out some awful looking thing which I've written here. But it, it's basically a, an upper bound on the integral of some expression that's quadratic in in the norm squared of omega, or alternatively quadratic in this modified scalar curvature. And in the case of hypersurface of minimal surfaces in spheres, this argument and this estimate go back to Simons in his famous paper on minimal hypersurfaces in spheres. And they, they actually directly this just recovers his, his result. And in the case of minimal of mean curvature zero Lagrangian submanifolds of 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 Kaler space forms, it recovers a result of Chen Yogi. I don't know how to pronounce his name that um, is of the same flavor of Simon's. And, and these results are sharp in the sense that the constants, what I'm calling C and K, that appear are, are these are the correct values and, and, and they're sharp. I, in the higher K, I'm only able to prove that the C and K has this upper bound, which is almost certainly not sharp. So I've written not sharp, but it's better to say I don't know that it's sharp and I doubt that it is. And, uh, but at any rate, one gets, so that means that to some extent the conclusion, conclusions are perhaps not quite as strong as in these cases, but in any case, one doesn't have in this k bigger than three case such a clear geometric interpretation for the solutions as one has in this case, in these two cases. Okay, so this is just to say that this machinery is sufficient to, 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 to prove rather powerful things about the behavior of solutions and that it somehow is giving a, a general framework in which these results and these results here are, are, appear in a common framework where at some point there's a bifurcation depending on, on a certain sign that appears in the equation, which somehow that sign is depending on, on the ambient geometry. So now what I wanna talk about is I wanna go back to these equations here and I wanna say, well, how, what about existence? I mean, can I say anything about are there are there even any interesting solutions at all? So the, the first observation is is that um, if I take H to be a flat metric, then this disappears completely. This all disappears completely, and and I, the result purely algebraic equations uh, for the tensor on, on this side, and. If I go ahead and assume that my tensor is, say, parallel, well, then these equations are automatic. And so I get some, a purely algebraic problem. And so that actually, that problem admits solutions, and, and they're, they're interesting ones. So in, in that case, so here's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming I have a, a flat metric, and I'm assuming I have a trace-free symmetric tensor, which is more of a parallel. So it's Kodazi, it's, it's whatever you want. It's, it's, got, it's got lots of nice properties. And, and it, then these two equations become just these purely algebraic equations, okay? These are, uh, it, it's, it's actually not completely obvious how easy these are to solve. The, the results I'm gonna show is, are that the second one, the coupled Einstein equations, admits a great number of solutions. The first one, uh, when K is three, I can characterize all solutions and, and there's sort of, in every dimension, a unique one. So this is a much stronger thing. And when K is bigger than three, I don't know anything about the characterization of the solutions in this case. So let me let me try to explain where such solutions might come from. So, so here's a, a way of reformulating. I'm just gonna reformulate the, the coupled Einstein equations. So my completely symmetric trait, I can identify this tensor with a with a k form, you know, I, it's just going to be p of x is omega applied on x k times. So, and the trace free condition means that it's it's Laplacian is zero. Here, I'm always I'm I'm usually thinking in Riemannian signature, but actually all this makes sense in any signature. 
And then you'd have to interpret the Laplacian in the appropriate signature. Most of the results I'll state will be in Ramanian signature, but it's interesting to think about other signatures. So, so if I rewrite, so here I'm calling what I call P on just now, I'm calling it F. But so I have a harmonic polynomial. It's homogeneous of some degree G. Uh, so G is the K. And, and I, this is supposed to be a superscript. This is supposed to be a meaning that the, so this is another way of saying that omega I1 to IG is just the, the, the G fold derivative of F. And, and so these are various ways of rewriting the coupled Einstein equations. So this is sort of immediately what they say, and this is rewriting them as the Hessian of this is zero. And, and that actually, because of homogeneity and the fact that everything inside is polynomial, that implies that this is zero. So the G minus one derivative of a G, homogeneity G polynomial is a linear form. So this is a quadratic form here. There's a difference of two quadratic forms. So if the Hessian is zero of, of a quadratic form and the quadratic form is zero. So that you get this equation. And, and in this case, the, the constants, so this, this C that appears here is actually determined by the norm of the tensor. It's not a free parameter. And so here, here, here are the first collection of interesting solutions. So um, the hypersurface in a sphere is called isoparametric if its principal curvatures are constant. That's not really the definition. It's really a characterization, but, but I don't want to get into too much detail. And it's, it's a theorem of Münzner uh, that builds on earlier work of Cartan that in, in this case, there are uh, the, the number of distinct pr principal curvatures is one, two, three, four, or six. And so the argument here is a topological argument. It's not uh, it's not not something I understand very well, and it's it's not easy to read because it's in, these articles are in German, um, and and they use a lot of algebraic topology machinery. And the multiplicities of, of these principal curvatures, ordered in decreasing order, um, are are satisfy this periodicity. Uh, where indices are taken mod g, and so there, there, are, there are most two distinct values of these multiplicities. In particular, when g is three, there's only one of them. And the final conclusion is that, that you can realize the isoparametric hypersurface is a level set of a degree g homogeneous polynomial, which solves these two equations. So this, this first equation is a sort of like tonal flavor equation. It says that the square of the gradient of of the polynomial is, is, a, is a power of the of the Euclidean quadratic form. And, and the Laplacian is, is some multiple of, of, of the power of the norm. And observe here that if G is three, this is zero. And so in the G equals three case, um, this would give it a harmonic polynomial. And, and one can deduce from this first equation that you have a solution of this equation here. And actually more generally, it turns out that, and so that, that uh, these polynomials solve the couple of Einstein equations. They're, they're more precisely said, the trace free part of their, of their highest order non-trivial derivative um, solves these equations. And so yields a solution to the couple of Einstein equation. And I believe that in all cases, it will be the case that the resulting solutions are not coupled projectively flat. I can actually prove it in the case when G equals three. And that's because in that case, there's some alternative interpretation of these solutions in terms of a certain commutative algebra. And I can actually do computations to show that. Uh, it's probably possible to do similar computations in the G four and six cases, but um, I haven't tried. Uh, the proof of this corollary is, is algebra with harmonic polynomials. Uh, so it takes about a page of, of calculations. It's, it's something you have to do. You have to use the, the, the usual sort of spherical harmonic algebra. The, 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 the algebra with harmonic polynomials that one uses to determine, to, the, to describe spherical harmonics. So, which is really representation theory of SL2. 
and you can you can prove this. So this gives a class of interesting examples. One might ask how many solutions are there here? Well, for, for the G equals three case, the solutions are all, what are they? They're two, uh, I, I, I'm gonna say it wrong. I wanna say two domains over Viranese embeddings. They're, they're constructed from the real numbers, the complex numbers, the quaternions and the octonions. And, and there, there are, there is one example associated to each of these. So there, this really gives you four interesting solutions in that case. Um, and, and, and I will come back to these solutions later from a different perspective. Okay, so that, that at least shows that there's some solutions. Um, here's another construction of solutions. Uh, it's also purely algebraic. Uh, here, I want to start with a K regular graph. So I'm thinking like a trivalent graph. So that just means that the, every, every vertex has the same number of edges coming out of it. Say K is three, it would be like this. And it has a finite vertex set. And I want to consider the partial Steiner system whose 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 blocks are k element subsets of one to n, where uh, the consisting of the edges incident in some vertex in V. So the typical example would be something like this. Um, which has seven vertices, one, two, three, I don't know, not, I, how to number them, and then seven in the middle. And, and so a block here is, for instance, one, five, three, this bottom line, uh, no, let's see, that's not what I want. Uh, I want the edges incident at a vertex. So for instance, this vertex here has three, four, five incident at it. And so that would be a block in my standard triple system. So I get collections of three element subsets, and that it means it's, that the partial Steiner system means that um, that uh, what does it mean? Uh, I have to. Uh, my brain is blanking on the definition of a Steiner system right now. Um, that any pair of indices three and four, for instance, are contained contained in at most one block, and um, and there's some other condition which I, my brain is escaping me. But but it it's satisfied by the the block the the blocks that correspond to a K regular graph, and it's needed in the proof of the theorem stated down below. And so th then I just consider the vector space generated by the edges of this graph, and um, in in such a way that with, equivalent with the metric for which the edge set is an order of normal basis, where where I've, I've I've started with an ordering of the and and then I I consider the to, to coordinates of, of a of a vector in this vector space with respect to this basis, and to to a given block of the Steiner system I associate a monomial, and then I just choose a system of signs, um, so, so that uh, however I like, and I form this this polynomial this this k homogeneity k polynomial, and it, it turns out this is a harmonic polynomial. And it, this pair, where I take its largest non-trivial derivative and solve the couple of Einstein equations, and this is actually just a this is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, it's you have to see the construction; it's harder than actually proving it. Uh, when k is three, uh, one can modify this in, in other ways. Uh, there are variants of this construction that yield uh, even more interesting solutions. But the, the main observation is there's a one parameter families of solutions um, in, in, that, in that setting. And um, in fact, when K is three, you can simply start with the data of a partial Steiner system. And, and so I won't go into detail there. So what this shows, these last two examples show, is that there are solutions with a flat background. In, in, in Riemannian signature in both cases. Defects of these solutions, and I thought I had included a slide about this, but I guess I didn't, are that, that um, they're not compact. So I'd like to find compact solutions. And of course, they're flat, the metric is flat. And so I'd like, I'd like to next describe a, a large class of examples that, that, that come from uh, affine differential geometry 
And, and to do this, I'm going to make a fairly serious digression into affine differential geometry. Um, Omid, what, what is the time? I don't remember what time I started. Um, you started 15 past. So okay. I mean, if you want to go an hour, you have 15, but you can go further. You no, can. I don't want to go much further because I, I'm, I'm of the belief that it's already, uh, that, that that's bad for the audience. So in general. Well, not for me, but sure. Well, okay. It depends. I, I don't mind, but, but I know that some people do. So, well, so I, I will, I will, I will go through this example at least. And, and, uh, so this is going to be kind of a break from what I've been talking about, and 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 in some sense a bit more elementary. Um, but I I don't know how well known affine differential geometry is to people. So you should you should think about where I want to think about a hypersurface in flat affine space, or more generally in a manifold with affine connection. And so everybody has seen the, the analogous question when the ambient manifold is a, is a metric, it has a metric on it. So the Euclidean geometry of hypersurfaces. So, and, and there you're interested in the invariance of the hypersurface with respect to the Euclidean motions. And when you're dealing with flat affine space, you're looking at a bigger group, which is the group of affine motions. Or in many cases, people really look at the group of volume preserving affine motions. But that means you have fewer invariants because you have a bigger group. And so things that are invariant in the, under the Euclidean group cease to be invariant. And in particular, orthogonality no longer makes sense. And one of the things that's confusing at first is that in Euclidean geometry, the, the shape operator and the second fundamental form are linked via the induced metric. Really, the shape operator is just the endomorphism determined by the second fundamental form with respect to the induced metric. And so they, they don't really contain ind independent information. And in affine geometry, they're completely independent objects somehow. Well, completely, maybe overstating it, but they're independent objects. And so this is something that requires getting used to. So I'm going to explain things in a little bit more generality. So to start with, I'm going to suppose I have an immersed hypersurface in a manifold equipped with a projective structure, which, is, as you recall, I just mean the equivalence class of affine connections whose torsion free affine connections whose geodesics as, as unparameterized sets are the same. So that I can define the second fundamental form just based on that data. It's a normal bundle value symmetric two tensor, which is defined by a picker representative of this projective structure. And I take the covariant derivative X and Y are tangent to the M and I project onto the normal bundle. And because any two representatives here differ by a one form, right? They differ by, they differ by something that looks like this. In particular, it's tangential. Uh, the, the projection won't actually depend on the trace of representative here. So it really only depends on the projective equivalence class of the ambient connection. And, and, and so you get a well-defined symmetric two tensor that takes values in the normal bundle. And that's what I'll call the second fundamental form. And I will say the immersion is not degenerate. If that, if that two tensor is not degenerate and it will become apparent from what I say now that that's actually makes sense. Um, so if, if you pick a local transversal to the hypersurface, so I just mean a vector field transverse to this hypersurface, uh, then, then you can represent the second fundamental form by an honest two tensor and, and, and you get an induced connection on M, which are defined in the usual way. So this is should be familiar to everybody. And if you vary, you can vary this transversal. Well, you can rescale it and you can add to it a tangential vector field. And when you do, this induced H rescales by the inverse of your scaling here, and your induced connection changes in some controlled way. In, in particular, um, this is already sufficient to, to justify the, the non degeneracy of, of the second fundamental form as a, a well defined condition, because the non degeneracy of, of H is not degenerate if and only if H tilde is not degenerate, because F is necessarily non zero. I can't yet speak of the signature because F could be negative. So I need, in order to speak of the signature, I need a co-orientation. So co-orientation, you, you can, I mean an orientation of a normal bundle. I mean, you can pick a style. So the Mobius band is not co-orientable. But uh, if I have a co-orientation, 
Then the second fundamental form plus the orientation determine a conformal structure, which is the equivalence class of these metrics determined by all possible choices of local transversals, uh, but where I only allow co-oriented choices of local transversal. Then I get an honest conformal structure. And th this construction means that that conformal structure is evidently invariant with respect to automorphisms of the ambient trajectory structure. So a non-degenerate immersed Kuiper surface in a manifold trajectory structure requires if it's co-oriented, it requires a conformal structure. I think that this is possibly the original motivation for studying conform. What's one of the early motivations for studying conformal structures? Um, I guess conformal structures are already in papers of Herman Weil, but but later people like Schoten. A lot of what I'm saying here is probably in, appears in some version in 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 Schoten's book on the Ricci calculus, although it's not in this language. But 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 this stuff back when when people first introduced notions of projective and conformal structures, people explored things along these lines. So as I said, nothing so far depends on the choice of the transversal, and uh, I can choose a scale if I choose on on my if I choose a volume density on my ambient manifold. So if I choose the volume density, that's enough to determine a unique representative of my projective structure that preserves it. And that's a straightforward little exercise. And, and then, then I get a pair coupled with a transversal, I get two different volume densities on, on M. One is the volume density determined by the induced H, this H. And the other is it, it determined by interior multiplying this W into the volume density on N. And so I can require that these coincide. And that's how one usually distinguishes what gets called the equiaffine metric or the Blaschka metric. So it gets this name in the context where my ambient space is flat affine space. And this is the usual standard volume density on flat affine space which is really determined only up the multiplication by a constant, but, but this connection then is, is the standard flat affine connection on affine space. And, and again, this, this induced metric is, is preserved by automorphisms of the projective structure that also preserve this, this volume density. I still haven't said anything about the direction of W of the transversal. None of this depended on its direction. Here I can add to it a tangential term without modifying anything. And, and H, H doesn't depend on the tangential direction. Okay. So not, nothing here depends on the on the on, on how W points. It only depends on how long it is. So the the way of choosing uh, a direction, well, here I'll describe the standard way of doing this in flat affine space, and then I'll explain how to do it in general. So if I have a locally convex hypersurface, I can describe the affine normal in the following way. I, I take my, my locally convex hypersurface and I take a point P, and I take the tangent plane at that point, and I parallel translate it. And it intersects the, it intersects the surface locally in, in, in convex domains. And their very centers describe a curve that passes through my original point. The affine normal is the, is the direction tangent to that curve at this point. Okay, That's the, the definition due to Blaschka. And so that distinguishes a, a particular direction. And if we go back here, we see that, that if, if uh, the, the induced connection depends on the direction, but it doesn't depend on the scaling. So that's enough to fix an induced connection. And so I refer to that as the connection induced via projection along the affine line. Now, in fact, one can define the affine normal line bundle uh, without assuming convexity and without assuming the flatness of the ambient connection. Neither of these matters. And, and, but we need a different definition. So let me, let me give this. So if, if I have a, a projective structure and a conformal structure, it's, it's an easy exercise to check, once you've observed that it's true, to check that there's a unique representative of the projective structure that, that satisfies this condition with respect to H, and I, I call this aligned, where 
and, and it should say here, this is, it should say, it should say for all H in H. So this condition doesn't depend on the choice of a representative metric. That's part of the claim. And that's just a, a little computation. And it, this picks out a unique representative here is another little computation. And probably a better conceptual way to understand this is if I associate with the convert conformal structure, this this uh, in, this is the inverse of, of, of a representative metric. And then this is chosen so that the resulting density value, the body vector doesn't depend on the choice of, of, of representative metric. This condition is just requiring that this divergence is zero. That's probably a better way to think about it, but it, it's it's requires working with density value forms, which not everybody enjoys. And so let me give a definition now. Um, so I'm going to call a pair of a projector structure and a formal structure an AH structure if for each representative connection, each representative metric, there's a one form that so they satisfy this condition here. And I'm going to identify such a pair with the simpler pair where the connection instead I have a connection instead of projector structure where this connection is just the aligned representative of this projector structure with respect to the conformal structure. Okay, so now I can now I can use using this notion of alignment, I can define the affine normal in general, and then uh, and then later I'll explain why I need this notion of AH structure. So um, I go back to the setting where I have this affine connection on my ambient space. And so the, the affine normal line bundle, I have a co-oriented non-degenerate hypersurface again. And the affine normal line bundle is determined uniquely by the requirement the induced connection be aligned with respect to the conformal structure determined by the second form of form and co-orientation. So this is something that uh, you do have to write out a little proof checking it, um, but it's it's mechanical. Once you've understood all the objects that go into it, it's just a question of doing calculation. And um, so it, it's not, it's not, uh, not, there's nothing deep here. Um, but it, it, it's a definition that works. It, I don't need flatness. I don't need any, any extra hypothesis here. And, and I don't need any assumption on the signature of the second one form. So I, I lose the nice geometric description, of, but with the benefit of more generality. I, I have no idea to whom this definition is originally due or if it's actually can be found in the literature in this generality. But again, I suspect that if you go back to old papers of in particular Stroten and, and people of that era and that ilk, you can find something equivalent to this written in them. Um, and, and maybe somebody here knows the literature better than I do there. But so if you if you vary this ambient, uh, so this is I'm just summarizing this, all this here is summarizing what I've just said. So I guess the only new comment here is that if 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 I vary this ambient connection projectively, the connection induced via the affine normal also varies projectively. Yeah, that's not what I meant to say. I, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. I don't need both of those. So let, let me, uh, I'll come back to the age structures, but let me tell you the one further ingredient that, that is special to the case where the ambient space is flat affine space. So in flat affine space, um, a non-degenerate immersed hypersurface gets a flat projector structure. And so how does it get this? Well, we have a co-normal Gauss map. So this associates to a point of this hypersurface the annihilator of its tangent space, which is, of course, a, a line, a one-dimensional subspace of the project. It's an element of the projectivization of the, 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 the dual of an affine space is a vector space. So I get a point in here. So I get this well-defined map. And it's it's an it's a straightforward exercise to check that this map's an immersion if and only if the hypersurface is non-degenerate in the sense that the second point all form is non-degenerate. And so I'll call with a bar this projector structure, which is flat. Which I just pull back. This is an immersion, so I can pull back a flat projector structure here to get a flat projector structure on it. And the this is no longer completely obvious, but but it, it can be checked that this projector structure generates. With the conformal structure, the term of the second conformal form of orientation and AH structure, in the sense that I defined a couple slides ago. This just you should think of as a generalization of a vinyl structure. 
Okay, I have a second projector structure floating. I can also, I can single out a representative connection here by taking the representative of this projector structure, which is aligned with respect to my conformal structure. And so here I've repeated the definition of the AH structure. And uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to, well, I'll just, I'll say it real quick. Uh, I should, let me see how many more slides I, let me, I want to try to get to, where, where do, well, let me, let me, let me summarize uh, what the conclusion is, and then, then I'll come back to some other things. The, 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 the part I want you to see here is, is this. So, um, the, if I have a, a non a chlorinated non-degenerative immersed hypersurface in flat affine space, I, I get this A structure I was just describing, the one that's generated by the flat projective structure and just be the clinical Gauss map and the induced conformal structure. And then it turns out that the, 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 the projective structure induced by the, via the affine normal together with the conformal structure also determines an AH structure. Moreover, it's aligned representative is actually the connection induced directly via the affine normal. And these two AH structures are in some sense dual uh, conjugate, and they satisfy this condition exact. Uh, that's what I'm skipping right now. And, and so you have these two, these two uh, induced structures on, on your hypersurface and flat affine space. And, okay, so, so um, let me try to, so evidently this has taken a lot more time than I was expecting it to. So let me, let me simply try to summarize for you how in the world this has something to do with the, so there's more that I want to explain here about where this comes from, but, but, let me try to summarize for you what this has to do with the couple of Einstein equations I was talking about before. Okay. So what, what it has to do is, is, um, is probably best explained in the following way. I, I really have a distinguished representative in each case. Okay. And what this exactness condition means is that when I write this, well, I was saying that I was saying that this is equal to this, right? For any representative. What the exactness condition means is there's a choice where I could of H such that this is zero. Okay. And so then that means that up I have I have actually a distinguished H. Well, it's distinguished up to homophony in each, okay? And it turns out it's the same in each in both cases. And so th this is this condition is what's usually called a statistical structure. So this notion of an exact AH structure is essentially the same thing as a special statistical structure because it will turn out that the, the determinant of H is, is parallel with respect to this connection also. So I have this pair of these two guys. Now, when I have... I have this, this NABLA and I have this H. Now I also have the levy media connection of H. And so I can write the difference tensor of these two guys. And here, that's what I've done here. And so you can forget all this text up above and just, and just look right here. This L is the difference tensor. And I'm gonna lower it, 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 it happens that, so it follows from, as I said, it, it's, it's actually the case in, the, in what I'm talking about that, that, that you have this, and this implies this trace free condition. And so that means when I lower the last index, I get a, a complete, a complete this, this tensor is completely symmetric. That's a consequence of the fact that when I skew symmetrize, the covariant derivative of H and I and J get zero, and it's trace free. And so the, the, the relation with the coupled Einstein equations is, is, is the following that 
for a particular class of affine of hypersurfaces, which are called the affine spheres, this tensor is, is a divergence free Kodazi tensor. And H and this tensor satisfy the couple of Einstein equations. They, in fact, so they actually satisfy the couple of projective and flat equations. And that's what is on the next several slides. And, um, and I, I thought I would get to more quickly today, but I'm, I'm bad at different time. So that's what I'll explain. I will, next time, what I will do is I will uh, explain these things that I skipped just now, and I will come back and explain this in detail. Um, but the, from my point of view, the, the, the point is simply that if I go back to these equations, this will show that there exists uh, via some theorem of Chang and Yao, which asserts, asserts the existence of many affine spheres. This will show that in the case k equals three, these equations admit many solutions that are non-trivial. And then the further observation is that one can actually descend these to compact quotient so that one can get a, a large number of compact examples. So it, the, the precise statement is that if I have what's called a convex flat real projective structure, it will carry a solution of, of, the, uh, of these equations. And, um, and there are known to be many such solutions where the associated connection where which are non-trivial in the sense that omega isn't zero. So that's 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 where I, I'm headed and 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 since I've, I've not given many talks about this before, or at least in, in recent years, I'm not judging well how long things are taking to explain. but but uh, I think this is a point where it makes sense to stop for today. Thank you. Are there any questions? Can I ask a question? Please. Um, so if I understand correctly, this uh, affine spheres, they give examples of coupled projective flatness, right? Uh, well, uh, yes. I mean, I think of them really as, as satisfying these equations, but it, it, it's it's a consequence of the fact that Somehow the the vile part of the the vile part of this tensor novel already vanishes. That's a consequence of basically the, the, the fact that uh, where is it that this connect this guy is already projectively flat forces a priori a lot of vanishing of a lot of curvature. So that so that in, in some sense in some for some modified vile tensor in some sense. These guys are already, there's already, all the curvature is encoded in the Ricci tensor already. So what I want to say is that, is there a class of um, hypersurfaces that satisfy Einstein, but I mean, what's the character? Is there a character? I, I, uh, I don't know any, no. I, no, no, if they satisfy, if, in this context, in the, in the affine, flat affine space, if they satisfy the Einstein equations, they are actually predictably flat automatically. Uh -huh. Yeah, but probably if you go to, can you say something? Because also there is now the larger class of projective hypersurfaces in PN. And well, so also... so the the place where it's possible one obtains. So part of the reason for observing that this setup works actually with a with a starting with a, a projective structure on the ambient space. Is it, it so? So first of all, how is an affine sphere defined? I didn't get there. An affine sphere is um, defined. I wrote the definition here. If if the affine normals meet in a point, or they're parallel, where you think of the point being infinity. So you should think of ellipsoids, hyperboloids, and, and elliptic paraboloids. The elliptic paraboloids are the case where they they meet at infinity. For an ellipsoid, the center is just the center of the ellipsoid in the usual sense. And the hyperboloid, it would be the center. It's the vertex of the cone to which the hyperboloid is asymptotic. And what the Cheng Yao theorem tells you is that you can take any cone, any sharp cone, and you get uh, it, its interior is foliated by hyperbolic affine spheres. And so that and that's a 
that gives you a huger number of them. But, um, and the, you could replace this flat outline space with the, the sphere with this VV study metric, a ground metric, or, or hydraulic space. Those are projectively flat. And so, and, and then you, you, with an alternative definition of affine sphere. So an equivalent statement is that the affine shape operator is a multiple of the identity. Okay, so these are the umbilic objects in affine differential geometry. And that definition continues to make sense for hypersurfaces and spheres and hydraulic space. For spheres, I, I haven't actually checked this, but for spheres, my guess is there aren't any interesting solutions. But for hyperbolic space, I suspect there are. Whether they're whether they're genuinely, I don't, yeah, I mean, but one should be careful there. I mean, I don't, and the the the, but but the the other point is that the the solutions that one obtains are. Um, they have this local, this guy is projectively flat, okay? And so somehow that actually characterizes the solutions which are locally equivalent to affine spheres, okay? So you, you can add, I, one comment is I do know, and I was hoping to get to this next time. Um, I can give you a, a compact example with, in Riemannian signature of, of, of some jet of, of, Solutions to the coupled Einstein equations, which are not coupled projectively flat, and and, and on SUN. Okay, yeah. and it's somehow related to uh, this isoparametric example I described earlier. Okay, so the, 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 I, I can't remember anymore what you asked exactly, but but uh, <laughs> I talked too much. But the, there there do there does exist a homogeneous example on SUN. Of, of a Riemannian signature um, solution to the to the coupled Einstein equations, which is not provably not coupled projectively flat, and which has otherwise all, every nice property you could want. Okay, so so and there should be good theorems. Giving more solutions, but but that's PE, and I, have, I haven't done. Yeah. In in other signatures, also there are. There, I mean, yeah. Okay, I won't say more. I don't. Care. I don't know if I answered your question or not by now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this um, hearing about. Um, uh, um, the uh, different uh, principal um, curvatures, like which can be one, two, three, four, six. Uh, this, yeah. Yes, it's quite mysterious. So, so what? Yeah, multiplicities. Yes, I, I, I didn't get it done when you formulated. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's only two different multiplicities. There are only two different. Uh, the point is that they they alternate. It's to say, if I order the if I order the principal curvatures in this way, this one has multiplicity M1, the next one is M2, the next one is M1 again. Yeah, it probably could be better said, but th this is how people tend to say it. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah. and when, it's, when, when, when it, it, this, oh, the, no, this is, I, I find, I, the proof of this is algebraic topo uh, topological and, and I, I've never managed I don't feel I understand it. You know, it's this one can follow, but that's a different matter. I, I don't understand where these numbers come from. And yeah, th there's a the I this is actually kind of an active thing. I mean, it's it was recently claimed that these are completely classified. So Cartan classified the solutions when when G is three and and it's known when G is three and six that um, well, they're infinite families when G is four, and and I think it's been recently claimed by several different people that it's completely finished. But I think that some of the papers, it's also claimed that some of those papers have errors in them, and I don't know the current status of the classification. But I mean, these were papers in Annals of Mathematics, and, and then, 
But the person where I would look, if you wanted to read about this, the, the most recent, there's some papers by Anna Sippert, I think is the name, um, has, a, has, has some recent stuff about this. And then there are some Chinese authors who, I mean, there's, there's a Japanese author, Mia, I think it's Mia Oka, and the first initial would, I think, be R. Aria, yeah. yeah. E, and then there's a... Um, Reiko. Reiko, that's right. And then there's some Chinese authors who I'm afraid I can't remember. The, the uh, Zhou, I think, is one of them. But, I mean, you need the first initial or this is useless. Um, but at any rate, and, and there's maybe Tang also. I think I can't, I, the problem is I can't remember. I may be confusing them with others with a different <laughs> related thing. But there, there's a pretty big role. And I can't, I can't, I, there's, there's Thorbergson as another author. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff written about this. I'm, I'm, you know, full details, but yeah. Yeah, this is a fascinating, this is a fascinating story in its own right. But yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. I mean, how, how many solutions of couples and the equations you get? get how many solutions this? of which here? Of course, yeah. From your well, in, in the G equals three case, you're getting solutions. Um, you're get there's there's basically the G equals three cases are you take the three by three trace free Hermitian matrices over R C H or the octonians and this zero means trace free with the trace free jordan product and there's an there's a metric on there and and so you take you take a form that looks like this where this is the trace free jordan product and so this is this cubic polynomial is this p and it can be written essentially as the determinant of x the, where this has to be defined in the octonian case and uh, and th this and this I mean this is all this all goes back to Cartan. The, the specific this polynomial has, has quite a lot of symmetry. It, it's yes, it's homogeneous for the automorphism group of this algebra, which is yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're hom they're homogeneous. Yeah, they're, okay. I mean, they're, they're yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 very symmetric. And it's it's actually the, what allows me to prove that, that these solutions are not coupled projectively flat is precisely this extra structure here. I mean, it's not it's it, it's what you expect, but you have to have some some something with which to. In these higher cases, it, I haven't tried. It's probably not very difficult, but to prove this same statement, but but um, it I just I haven't thought as much about the. The corresponding examples in these cases, and there are. Well, but when you say it's not projective flat, do you refer to real case or to all possible cases like emissions? No, he, here in the G equals three. So it, this is actually I'm viewing this is a this is a real vector space in all all, all four <laughs> cases. Yeah. So yeah, the dimensions here are going to be five. Um, well the the. Five, whatever they are, five, nine, something, and probably twenty-six, and whatever goes in here, fourteen, I guess. I'm guessing it's fourteen. I can't. Think. <laughs> it's too hard for me to. Yeah, twenty-six is is four, four, right? Or maybe it's twenty-five. I mean, it's it's. No, uh, no, no. It should be twenty-six. The permission should be two plus. Yeah, two, yeah, these are right. These are right. This one's maybe not right. This is eight. Yeah. Very interesting. Now they look right. So with G equals three, you get you get solutions in these dimensions. 